Hello, everyone. Um, welcome all. Um, hello, hello. Um, welcome to the Stella Adler Center for the Arts online. Uh, I'm so excited uh, to have you with us tonight and um, to bring you this important and uh, timely celebration. So I just want to do some housekeeping uh, prior to uh, uh, brief remarks and then um, uh, so, um, so just to say, we are recording tonight's um, event in order to be able to share it with people that aren't able to be with us tonight, including um, our students on Rikers Island. Um, so I just want to welcome them. Um, also, right now, the, the chat feature is disabled, uh, but there will be time for questions, at which point the chat will be turned back on. So we are here tonight uh, to celebrate the book Remnants, a memoir of spirit, activism, and mothering. This book is, this is a book with two authors, um, as I understand it, um, Rosemary Freeney Harding and her daughter, Rachel Elizabeth Harding. Um, but the book uh, truly contains multitudes. Uh, it, it is a marvel of a book. It shape shifts right in your very hands and eyes, going from memoir to poetry, to short story, to history, to spiritual guide. It is as profound a response to the evils of our time, which quoting Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, are racism, extreme materialism and militarism as any I've ever read. Remnants wields the power of love or in the parlance of the book, radical compassion uh, in such a way that hope is revealed even in the face of what seems like the dissolution of democracy itself. In our divided world where demonization is the currency of social media and human beings can no longer see each other except as mere political abstractions as the evil other, remnants offers agape, empathy, a vision of love. No wonder then that our dear sister Sonia Sanchez is responsible for bringing remnants to Adler. Sister Sonia, Poet, playwright, professor, prophetess, spiritual guide. You are our mother, sister, friend, mentor, board member, poet in residence, poet laureate. You have brought us readings, lectures, symposia, Toni Morrison, Tanahasi Coates, Toshi Regan, Ruby Sales, the Billie Holiday Theater, the Schomburg Center, Rachel Harding, and the glorious remnants of her extraordinary family, not to mention the litany of ancestors you intone at events like this, which include Rosemary and Vincent Harding, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and so many more. My dear Mama Sonia, you've expanded our world and brought us riches beyond measure. And most importantly, you bring us love. And you bring love not as a sentiment or a feeling, you bring us love as a deed, love as an action love as rebellion, love as resistance. Friends and families, please welcome Sister Sonia Sanchez. How are you doing, my dear brother? It's so good seeing you. It's and so good it's so seeing good. you. Yeah, 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 it really is. One day soon, we're all gonna get together uh, in New York City and we're gonna hug each other. 
<laughs> again, right? Yeah, I won't even come with, with this <laughs> anymore, right. right? But it's so good, say Sister Rachel, is this, is, is, is Rachel on as yet? I, I think. So. I am. Hey, sister. Yes, how are you doing? How are I didn't you? see you before over there. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you look beautiful, my dear sister, you know? So and it is just so good being here with the theater, with brother, with brother Tom and all of the people, you know, I see now also sitting there uh, out front. But um you know, I, I'd, I'd like to begin, if you don't mind, uh, if you would begin by reading a poem, uh, Rachel. Sure, I would be happy to start. I think um, what I will read is just the first um, small portion of Remnants, which I think reads a little like poetry. It's about a minute and a half, two minutes oh. long. Mm -hmm. It's the, um, the beginning of the daughter's praise in the foreword of the book, the very first words of the book. There is no scarcity. There is no shortage, no lack of love, of compassion, of joy in the world. There is enough. There is more than enough. Only fear and greed make us think otherwise. No one needs starve. There is enough land and enough food. No one need die of thirst. There is enough water. No one need live without mercy. There is no end to grace. And we are all instruments of grace. The more we give it, the more we share it, the more we use it, the more God makes. There is no scarcity of love. There is plenty and always more. This is the universe my mother lived in. Her words, her ways, this is the universe she was raised in by parents from rural Georgia who came up in the generation after slavery. People who had lived with many terrors, but who knew terror was not God's final say. This is the universe she taught me. Whatever I call religion, is this inclusive Christian, indigenous, black, southern cosmology of compassion and connectedness. It is the poetry of my mother's life. <laughs> oh, that is beautiful. And as I watch you, you, you read, my dear sister, I remember when I first met you uh, down in a place called Atlanta, Georgia, you and your brother, you were these little little kids running around. And I used to always say to all the children of my friends, one day you'll be taller than I. <laughs> Probably the next time I see you. And believe me, they were taller than I. It's an amazing thing. I've been I'm at not readings. by much. I'm not <laughs> much taller. <laughs> but I've been at readings, right? And someone has come up to me and said, you don't remember me, but you said once to me, one day you'll be taller than I, and I am. But it's a joy to see you. It's a joy also to know um, and remember uh, what a fine poet you are. Uh, I don't know if Tom knows if I mentioned to him that um, you know one day I I dragged you off to a reading with me. You know, and because I knew that Rachel wrote uh, had begun to write poetry, and I said to her on the way there. I'm going to ask you to read a poem at the beginning. And I saw her shake a little bit like, you know, why am I here? Uh, but we got there and she got on stage. And one of the things that I just simply love about Rachel is that she got up on the stage and she said, you know, like, I am here. I'm going to really read. And people just stood up and gave you a standing ovation, if you remember. And it was just beautiful. And I thought, I said, okay, 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 Vincent. 
you know, you know, okay, 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 okay. You know, here we are, Rosemary. You know, that's your daughter up there um, because she is a poet. Um, and I'm always asking you to write more and more poetry. But what you began with was a, was a prose poem, my dear sister, and that was beautiful. Um, I was asked to read something also too, if you don't mind, since it's Black History Month, I'd like to read the piece that I did for Brother Martin. Um, one of the children asked me, why don't you start getting a new book, you know, get one of the newer books that you have. And I said, well, you know, I've, I've used this book so long, right? And, it's, and every time I pick it up, it looks so worn and I have things written all inside, you know, um, you know uh, where the lines are, but I'm so accustomed to it. But this is called Morning Song and Evening Walk for Martin Luther King. One, tonight in need of you and God, I move imperfect through this ancient city, quiet, no one hears, no one feels the tears of multitudes. The silence thickens. I have lost the shore of your kind seasons. Who will hear my voice nasal against distingu distinguished actors? Oh, I am tired of voices without sound. I will rest on this ground full of mass hymns too. You have been here since I can remember Martin from Selma to Montgomery, from Watts to Chicago, from Nobel Peace Prize to Memphis, Tennessee, on move among the angles and corners of aristocratic confusion. It was a time to be born, forced forward, a time to wander inside drums, the good times with eyes like stars and soldiers without medals or weapons, but honor, yes. And you told us, the storm is rising against the privileged minority of the earth from which there is no shelter in isolation or armament. And you told us the storm will not abate until a just distribution of the fruits of the earth enables men and women everywhere to live in dignity and human decency. Three, all summer long it has rained and the waters rise in our throats and all that we sing is rumored forgotten. Whom shall we call when this song comes of age? And they came into the city carrying their fastings in their eyes. And the young nine-year-old Sudanese boy said, I want something to eat at night, a place to sleep. And they came into the city hands salivating guns. And the young nine-year-old words not read with vows, mama, mama, auntie, auntie, I dead, I dead, I dead for in our city of lost alphabets, where only our eyes strengthen the children. You spoke like Peter, like John, you fishermen of tongues, untangling our wings. You inaugurated iron for our mass. Exile no one with your touch, and we felt the thunder in your hands. We are soldiers in the army. We have to fight, although we have to cry. We have to hold up the freedom banners. We have to hold it up until we die. And you said, we must keep going and we became small miracles, pushed the wind down, entered the slow bloodstream of America, surround the streets and regal juntadas, tune our legs against Olympic politicians, elaborate cadavers growing fat underneath Western hats. And we scraped the rust from old laws, went floor by floor, window by window, and clean faces rose from the dust, became new brides and bridegrooms among change, men and women coming for their inheritance. And you challenged us to catch up with our own breaths, to breathe in Latinos, Asians, Native Americans, transgenders, whites, blacks, gays, lesbians, Muslims, and Jews, Chicanos, to gather up our rainbow colored skins in love and peace and racial justice as we try to answer your long ago question, is there a non-violent peacemaking army that can shut down the Pentagon? And you challenge us to breathe in Bernard Herring's words, the materialistic growth mania for more and more production and more and more markets for selling unnecessary and even damaging products is a sin against the generation to come. What shall we leave to them? Rubbish, atomic weapons, numerous enough to make the earth uninhabitable, a poison atmosphere, polluted water. Five, 
Love and practice is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love and dreams, said a Russian writer. Now I know at great cost, Barton, that as we burn, something moves out of the flames called the spirit of apparition till no fire or body or ash remain. We breathe out and smell the world again. Amen. Amen, 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 men, men, a woman, a woman, a woman, 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 men, 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 woman, 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 amen, amen, a woman, amen, 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 a woman. And that's the piece that um, that I did of Brother Martin. Um, and um you know, I, I think so much um, about you and your family. I remember um, when I came down uh, to Atlanta and I remember that they brought me down to do a reading and also they were raising money. And I remember that a lot of the poems I read were like fiery poems, right? <laughs> I remember Vincent and, and your mother, you know, they came over and hugged me and said, yes, 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 we need, we need, we need that, we need that. And, and as I grew to know them, quite often things would come up and we would travel out of a town together, out of a city together, and I would be all talkative and riled up and did you hear whatever? And Vincent would be driving slowly because he always drove slowly, remember? Right, you know? And, and Rosemary would be sitting there and she would be quiet. And she says, I hear you, Sonia. And she quieted me down with just, I hear you, Sonia, because I was always there saying, what, what we must do now after we saw what happened, what we must be there. And then the silence and the quiet there and the listening because they always listen to you. There was never rudeness. There was always the listening to you, you know, but always bringing you into their circle uh, of quiet, their circle of reflect, reflection, their circle that says simply, we hear you. And that's why you're here with us, you know, so we can sit together and listen to each other, but also so you can listen to us and hear how quiet we are as we move on this journey towards retribution on this journey towards change, right? And we will introduce you also to something called quiet also too. It'd be good for your body, for your heart, you know, for your eyes, for your hands, for your toe jam. You must understand how they would equalize each other. I'm so grateful uh, mm -hmm. for your parents, my dear sister. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so filled and I have so much to say, but um, first I just wanna acknowledge kind of where we are in this virtual space where all I'm seeing at the moment is you, Aunt Sonia, and maybe four or five people in that little part of the screen above, but I can see that there's a number of 194 people together in this space. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's odd, uh, we're all kind of getting used to it, but it's odd, but I want to thank Tom and the Stella Adler studio and you, Aunt Sonia, mm -hmm. for bringing us together and giving us this opportunity to talk not only about my parents, but about that period in our country where you and Amiri and Haki and Tony and Alice and Bernice and Zahara and so many thousands and thousands of people began to make an extraordinary change in this country that stays with us in ways that we don't see sometimes, but that is still enriching and enlivening and strengthening us. So, but just listening to you, I mean, you, you read the poem and then you gave more um, poetic understandings of, of your connection, your deep connection with, with the family. And my memories, of course, you know, I was, like you said, I was a little girl. I don't even know if I remember the Atlanta meeting, but I definitely remember Philadelphia when you and Mangu and Marani came 
um, you were beginning your um, your your time at, at Temple, where you stayed for for decades and and finally uh, retired um, um, as the Laura Carnell Professor there. But when you first came, you all stayed with us. That's right. And we were, that's right. And we were renting. I mean, we we literally used to move almost every year because my oh. father was, you know, didn't have a stable job and he was trying to find space and time and opportunity to write there is a river and and whenever you know one uh lease was up we'd find another one and during one of those summers when we were between houses you came with the boys and stayed with us and that was the beginning for me of this magnificent mentorship and auntieship and sistership that you have been for me and the way that you um, perhaps more than anybody outside of my parents just pushed and encouraged my writing and gave me the understanding that I could do this and that this was something that I should do. And so I'm so thankful to you, Aksan. So I don't know if you remember, but at one point when you were at a school, which I don't have to name, and and people were just saying things that, you know, this and that about you. And I remember grabbing you saying, do you know just how bright you are? Do you know who you are? You know who your parents are? Whatever. You can't let people tell you, you know, that you can't do this and you can't do that. I mean, you know, um, and that was why um, the, the joy of being in academia, but the joy of also seeing the children of our comrades along the way. And I have seen you grow, you know, I have seen you move. I've seen you on stages sometimes when I've run in some place and I've seen you on stage and I run out and didn't have a chance to say anything, say goodbye, but I would report to your father <laughs> that I had seen you. And I said, you know, she was bad up there on that stage, right? <laughs> you know, but you know, she has, but, 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 but I said, what's so interesting about Rachel is that, you know, she has this soft demeanor, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden people realize that they've been whipped <laughs> with that soft demeanor, right, you know? And that was what was always so very funny because I was sitting in the audience and here it comes, uh-huh, you know, and she was there with such gentleness, but all of a sudden people realize, whoa, you know, where has she taken us? But that is the joy of seeing what you have learned um, and how you have progressed and how it's so great this memory, you know, of how we remember the family, always the family. And, and I remember, um, you know, when your dad was in the hospital, how we all converged on him, right? We sat on the bed, you know, we made jokes, you know, and whatever, et cetera. And then we went out to eat. Um, uh, you know, in a restaurant right there, right there near you, Penn, University of Pennsylvania, and how we began to talk about our history and history uh, together. Um, but above all, I want people to hear um, and know uh, about this book and the importance of this book and the work that you're going to begin to do also on your father. Um, uh, this book that took probably about a good 10 or 12 years uh, uh, to do. Um, and I remember when I would call up to Boston quite often, I would hear your voice and I would hear the tiredness. And so, you know, quite often, I'm always have been the person around people if they're sick or if they're tired that I will do the funny stuff, you know? I mean, I've gone in hospitals and said, I'm here. I will not dance for you, right? And of course, the people who were sick would fall out laughing and the nurses would look like, where did she come from? But I would do a dance and so you thought I couldn't tap dance her. You thought I couldn't sing. Let me tell you now what I can do for you. And it is that kind of reality. And I would say some things to you and you would give the phone to your mom and we would talk for a while. But I also understand, um, you know, to work on a book for 10 to 12 years, how you put your own work, you know, at a standstill, you know, for a while. But I also know you understood one important thing. It was important for people to know who this woman was, you know, what she was, what work she was doing on this earth, whatever. It's so important that people understand what people have done, what people do, and what they leave behind. And people should learn that because you see, we can't continue on 
as a people and as uh, and as people trying to affect change in this place called America that needs the kind of change that we talk about and many people like us talk about and like Tom talks about also too, you know, in America without understanding, you know, uh, where we are, you know, what people have done, what they have said, what they have thought, um, how they have moved on this earth with such grace, with such beauty, with such information also too. And for us to move and continue, you know, this ascent, you know, upward or whatever, we've got to understand the information that's already there, that we don't have to always reinvent ourselves. I do know that I have said that we do have to reimagine ourselves every 10 or 12 years. That's different, you know, from creating ourselves, right? Um, it is that kind of thing. So if I can just you know, ask you to begin to talk about uh, the book, uh, if, if you don't mind, is that all right? Thank you so much. I'd be happy to, yes. Um, as you said, um, Aunt Sonia, the, the book did take, let's see, we started in about 1997. Um, my mother was able to do a year at the Bunting Institute, um, which at the time was organized primarily for women um, mm -hmm. scholars, activists, artists who, by virtue of the kinds of, of limitations and pressures and responsibilities that women often carry uh, in <laughs> our families, have not always mm -hmm. had the space and time to do their work. And mm -hmm. so um, she she got a Bunting Fellowship and I had just finished um, my PhD and mm -hmm. didn't have a job at the time and was caring for her because she had already started to get a little sick. So the two of us went to um, Cambridge from Denver and began working on this project. And at the time, my mom um, was legally blind with cataracts. She mm -hmm. had a um, very odd, um, relatively rare, debilitating um, uh, side effect of diabetes, adult onset diabetes, which was, uh, the diabetes itself was relatively new for her. It had only been diagnosed maybe a year or two before, but she had this thing called diabetic neuropathic cachexia, which is a kind of uh, diabetes that causes strange pains in different parts of your body. She said sometimes it would feel like fire running through her bones or like someone hitting her or someone sticking her with pins. And, and then it causes great weight loss. And it took a long time, probably at least uh, 12 months just to get that diagnosis. But interestingly enough, the person who, at least in this country, was best known for treating this was in um, the Boston area. So we were able to see this doctor. She was able to um, spend some time. And uh, even though it took her a while to get well enough even to have cataract surgery, she would sit with a tape recorder and we, she would tell me stories. We would talk, I would ask questions, and then I would take the tapes and start transcribing them. And then um, I would read her what I had transcribed and she would say, no, I kind of want it this way. Or I might add another story that I knew about. I say, mama, let's add this. And she said, yeah, let's add this. So um, it, the, the book began to take shape in that context. Initially, she really wanted not to tell so much her story. She wanted to tell the stories of um, the people who had been her companions in the movement for um, compassionate social transformation of our society. People like you, Aunt Sonia, people like Grace Boggs, Grace mm -hmm. and Jimmy Boggs, um, people like Bernice Johnson Reagan, um, lots of folks, the Moseses, Bob and Janet Moses. Now, a number of those people did get into the book, but I think what happened was because I was working with her and because in some ways, this was the first time as an adult where I had this extensive unbroken time with my mother. Mm -hmm. I began to ask her things about her life, about our family. And she also began to sense that there were some things that I needed. You know, that there was some, some secret internal work. Yes. And mm -hmm. so she started giving me 
um, what, what she could sense that I still needed to really develop into who I was going to need to be uh, in this world. And I had this opportunity to just ask her these questions. So because of that, the book then began to take more a kind of autobiographical or, or memoirish uh, um, element more centered around her story um, mm -hmm. because that's what I was interested in and we ended up talking more about it. But her intention was always to try to share um, some encouragement, some inspiration, some stories of the movement uh, particularly the movement that she lived through mm -hmm. that would help this current generation know that all of us who are here now have ancestors in this work who had another vision for what's possible in this country, for a more humane nation, for a more compassionate nation, for a really just multiracial nation. We're not the first people to be thinking about that. There are long long lineages and she wanted folks to know you got folks in your corner you got ancestors who have been right. doing this work and here are some of the the steps and some of the ideas and some of the beauty that they have created so you can follow so you can you can do this too could i ask you a question did she ever talk about anything that surprised you Ooh. i hope that's not i hope that's not a, a, no, that's a Okay, that's a that, good you know because question. sometimes you know when when you begin to to talk um, you know Papa Joe Jones the drama uh, was a first cousin of mine and he wanted me to do his um, you know his biography uh, but he was in a, a period that it just never went off you know we finished but every now and then you know he would say something that was like whoa I, it, my head went back you know um, and Papa Joe Jones was this great drummer. Right, um, uh, my, my my father, who was a drummer, taught him how to play the drums. But he would come to our house in Alabama during World War II, and when my sister and I saw him, we run because you know he was like, I mean, he was like a drummer. He was always, you know, talking and moving at the same time, and a foot was tapping and a hand was clapping, whatever, etc. But what he was doing is that he was heading for me and my sister and he grabbed you and he'd be talking to my dad and he'd throw you up in the air and, say, Is that and he'd catch you at the last minute. That's the kind of rhythm he had, oh right? You know, you know? <laughs> and we sit down to eat and he was always chewing gum. You know, and my sister would be running. He, he said, I got you, Pat. I got you, Pat. He'd throw her up and he'd catch her too at the same. I mean, the rhythm was, I mean, just unbelievable, right? And he'd sit at the dining table and he'd be patting with his foot. And then when the food came, he'd take the gum out of his mouth and put it on the, the dining room table, right? And my sister and I went, ugh, isn't it? <laughs> horrible but we took our gum out at night and put it at the end of the bed isn't that amazing right and that wasn't so horrible but there was something later on you know that um i know i didn't know that he was a first cousin and and one of the you know as i was interviewing him he said you know that you know, that that your mother was my was my first cousin you know, you know, and I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, yes. And she went off and she married your father, you know, you know, he said, but you know, your father's not a great drummer like me, you know, <laughs> you know, oh, and, and I would say, you're right. He's not, or you are, you and Max are geniuses, whatever, you know, uh, my father was a drummer, you know, but in the first, um, in the first Alabama uh, Jazz Hall of Fame, they're all in that museum uh, together yeah. because, um, uh, you know, they played jazz, you know, uh, they were the first ones who played jazz, whatever. But, you know, there are things that they begin to tell you about family sometimes, you know, that you never knew. So I was saying all this to give you a chance, Thank you know, to think of, of if there happened to be anything. Um, because, uh, uh, you know, you, you said something that was important that you were an adult then now dealing with your mother. You were not the daughter, you were not the student, you know, you were not the one, you know, just living at home, you know, saying, I gotta go out and find a job, right? You know, you were a woman, you know, and that was the difference. There were two women now, you know, facing each other. And yeah. your and your mom, you know, had the, 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 the ability to, to, to analyze that and to say things to you as I read it, you know, your, the book, right? That you had to hear for your survival, 
you know, you know, yeah. for you to continue this, you see. The point of a movement is that it does not continue. Stasis happens when that is stopped. And mm. one of the things that has happened in my head in this country is that they stopped that, you know, that continuation that we saw earlier. I mean, I came into a movement because of certain people who were there, whatever they were, you know, uh, you know, they were there, Elizabeth Catlin, they were there, you know, for you, you know, they were there and they came with information, you know, Gwendolyn Brooks, Margaret Walker, you know, we thought we were the baddest things on the planet earth. And then we <laughs> leaned back and heard them read with a oops, you know, mistake, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, but they came with information and Elizabeth would tell me things that you look for. You know, that you go say, Queen Mother Moore was there. She'd tell you, these are the people you look for because they would say these words. And the ones who say these words, they're not your friend. They're not in the movement. They're there for glamour, whatever, et cetera, if you understand what I'm saying. And, and those are the people. And they would tell you that this does not work. Don't try that. We tried it already. And we need to tell people, don't go that route. It doesn't work. You know, you know, you know, the, the, the country knows how to, you know, to circumvent that. So therefore, let us think of another way to do things. So I, I you know, uh, I, I was always, um, there was always, you know, sometimes you, you know, we see things, you know, and, you know, and I could always see, you know, uh, uh, the color around your mother, you know, whatever, you know, um, you know, you know, um, and and you knew then at some point, you know, that she had uh, a message, she had uh, a holy message that was there also too, that we had to hear. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Well, it's interesting, um, uh, Sonia, that you end on that piece about um, your own capacity to see. Uh, which I know you don't talk about very much, but as a poet and as a woman with your history and your uh, lineage, um, you know you are you are not uh, you are not um, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? It's not un uncommon among um, Af in in our African American tradition of the capacity to recognize a certain energy, a certain um, uh, quality of, of spirit, of life. When you asked me what surprised me uh, in working with my mom, I have to say initially, I don't think the stories themselves, any of the stories that she shared, there were a few things that other family members had shared with me that were new. But my mom, um, you know, kind of all my life, I had been hearing versions of most of the things that are in um, Remnants. But what did surprise me, and this comes back to what you, were, what, what you were just saying, were a number of experiences, powerful experiences of spirit that I had with my mother. Mm -hmm. um, one in particular that, that we, uh, is a story we tell in the book was when she was first getting sick and I didn't realize how sick she was and we were in a um, in a grocery store together in Denver and I can see it in my mind as clear as if it were yesterday we were walking in um, an aisle and I don't know what it was that I said but I said something sharp to my mother you know something mm -hmm. not kind right. and as soon as I said it it was as if something just, you know, I looked at her face and it was as if I had hit her. I, and I had not physically, of course, but my words were very sharp. And she looked so pained and just inside me immediately, I started to feel like, oh boy, what did I do? And that night I had this dream. And in the dream, I saw four or five tall, extraordinarily built women. And they all had on these long robes and they were all different races. There was, you know, a, a dark skin, black one. There was kind of a brown skin, maybe looked like she was indigenous to this um, hemisphere. There's a white one, an Asian one. Um, and my mother was standing behind them. This is all in the dream. And you know how in a dream, Mm -hmm. um, you can 
you can understand things, what people are saying without actually hearing them. And they were, they said to me, what do you know of mothering? <laughs> and then it was almost as if they were saying, you know, this is our child and you will have to treat her well or we're going to keep her away from you. Mm -hmm. That dream scared yeah. me so profoundly, Aunt Sonia. That dream scared mm -hmm. I didn't talk about it for a year. Mm -hmm. When we got to Cambridge and started working on the book is when I was able to tell my mother the dream. Mm -hmm. And she just took that dream. First of all, she, um, by the time I had told her some, oh, the, in the dream, they actually told me, you know, that they were the Pachamamas. And then I, when I woke up, I went and looked and said, well, what is this? This is the uh, traditional um, Andean in the Quechua language, the name for Mother Earth, the the um, the generative um, primary female uh, life giving energy of the Andean people. And but in the dream, what was so interesting was that all of these women who were all quote unquote of different races we're all taking care of each other's children. And that was their role in the world. We all belong to all of them. Okay. And you could not tell which one was, it wasn't like all the black people were with the black one or all the white one people. I mean, every they, they were all of our mothers and we were all of their children. And my mama was special to them. So when they were like, you need to take, you need to be careful. So, um, Find, you know, I told her about the dream, but what she grabbed onto, what she loved was just this idea of these feminine, mothering, powerful, protective energies that were here for everybody in the world. And she started thinking of these, and this, some of this, what I'm just telling you did get into the book and some other things that she thought of, but she had this whole set of of um, stories about women in Eastern Europe who, and you talk about something Afrofuturist, right? Who come and like reincarnate as little black, a little black boy and girl in Alabama in the middle of a movement. I mean, so her mind was just going on uh, all of these ways of connecting um, people who are concerned about other people all over the world. That was her her thing, my mama's thing. And it came through in this dream. And that that um, surprised me and frightened me and and put a, put a fire up under my butt, frankly. <laughs> so it helped, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that is, um, you know, my sister, um, you know, uh, dreams are amazing. I was uh, uh, being interviewed for something, I don't know. And, um, and, and one of the questions, was that, uh, do you dream? And I said, well, I guess I do, I don't remember them. But I just, you know, I did one of those shrugs. And 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 then well, the young man said, uh, I think he was young, he sounded young on the phone. He said, well, um, I thought I heard you say once that when you were writing a book that you, that you had recurrent, the same dream every time you went to sleep. And that was um, a blues book for Blue Black Magical Women. Yeah. And I said, uh, yes, that is, I, it, it is true. I, I said, where did you read that interview? <laughs> you know, right. And I said, yes, that is true. I said, when I started to write that book, um, I went to sleep and I began to dream about uh, being in a tomb, in tombs, in a tomb uh, with uh, a mother. Um, uh, and it, it seemed to have been in Egypt and and she was dressed in blue. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I woke up, I literally woke up from it, right? And I was, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, I, you know, I went downstairs and, and put some tea on because I think tea will cure everything probably, right? Um, uh, but I had, it's so interesting is that I had just stumbled on the name for the book, a blues book for blue, black, magical women, you know? So I said, oh, that's probably what, where your head is, Sonia, at this particular point. What's significant about this 
is that I went to sleep and I started to dream again and I, I made myself wake up. You know, and I, I kept saying, no, 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 this is like, you know, in a tomb, you know, we're together. But it was not threatening that when I went back, I realized it was not threatening that she began to talk to me yes. and to heal me mm -hmm. and to tell me about how this book had to move, mm -hmm. that this book was an important book and I had to be careful you know, what I said in the book. And it went on and on and on and until such a point that I would climb in bed early to go to sleep, to be competent, you know, by my mother. Mm. That I realized that was my mother, you know. My wow. mother would die giving birth to twins. <laughs> and some years later, I gave birth to twins, right? Um, uh, you know, my mother, um, who um, uh, on many levels um, uh, that my father never talked about at all. But when I was giving birth to twins, I didn't know I was having twins. You know, I got, as they said, a the doctor that nobody liked. There were two men who had a, a um, you know, had the same practice, you know, um, but he, um, and I was doing at that time natural childbirth that they said was, he said to me, oh, so you're one of those, you like pain, huh? And I'm thinking if, you know, this baby is ready to come, right? And zoom, out comes Mungu, right? And then I said, good, I can go to sleep now. And the doctor pushed for the afterbirth and he said, oops, there's another one. And I remember saying, please don't find a third one because I only have two hands, right? You know, and two arms. And, and he said, put her out. And I kept saying, no, I'm having natural child. And I was out and boom, I have the twins. And I remember going into the room and they said they had them in like, they weren't too small, but they had them in like a, a, a kind of incubator kind of thing, warmth for warmth. And I remember calling my dad hmm. and I said to my father, I've delivered twins and he started to cry. Yeah. He didn't cry, he sobbed. I'm so glad there's so many different words for crying. He sobbed because he remembered his wife, as he said, the only woman he ever loved had died giving birth to twins. And I said, well, I'm gonna go to sleep. I'm really tired. I just wanted you to know, dad. I went to sleep and in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, I heard someone call, Sonia. And I woke up, sat up and I said, yes, and this very little short woman, just as, as tall as I am, as short as I am, the nurse was passing by. She said, girl, what are you doing sitting up? Because I, I had all these tubes, you know, whatever. And I said, someone's calling me. She says, no one's calling you. I said, oh yes, someone's called my name twice. And she said, oh, let me put you down. And she came over and she said, oh my God. Hmm. And I, she said, go to sleep. And the last thing I remember, she was adjusting, you know, you know, um, the, the, the tube there, right? And she put her hands on my stomach. She started rubbing my belly. And the next morning, the doctor came in and said, we almost lost you there last night. But the nurse stayed with you the entire night, you know, because he had put this in, it was too strong and your belly was hardening, right? And you would have died during the night. And that's what my, how my mother died, you know? So I say it was my mother saying simply, you know, the generation has got to continue. Yeah. You will not die at all. And, but what I remember, all of that had come, you know, at, at some point that every night that I had this conversation with this woman in blue, mm -hmm. right, whatever, you know, she was telling me about the book, but I knew as I entered into her arms, she was my mother. Yes, yes, I understand, I understand. So I'm saying all that to say, that's when you, your mother really became your mother. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true, Aunt Sonia. Mm -hmm. It transformed our relationship. It really did. That whole experience with her. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh -huh. So I don't know how we're doing on time, but do we read, would you like to read another piece? Sure. Right? Is there anything else you'd like to say about the book? Oh, goodness. Um, no, I'm just, just, I love the opportunity to share with people. So I'm just grateful, grateful mm -hmm. for. So you're going to read from the book again? Yes, I, I, <laughs> I would like to, um, I'll, I'll read something that's actually structured as 
as a poem. It's uh, the 41st chapter of the book and it's called Fujida, which um, means escaped. The, the, it's a poem for Oya and Oya or Iansan is the energy of wind, of transformation, of connection to ancestors. She's a powerful um, feminine warrior energy in the Yoruba uh, pantheon and in the Candomblé tradition that, that I'm connected to. And so this poem um, just has a couple of words I want to mention in case people are unfamiliar. Simaron, which is a term for maroons or runaways, and quilombo is a Portuguese word for a community of uh, fugitive slaves and other refugees and their descendants. Okay, so the poem is called Fujida, poem for Oya. Wind covering the newly dead with your remnant cloth, the hush hush of your sanctified Cimarron name your high legs stuttering at the river edge, them running meet you there. Some follow, some push ahead. Oya, uncaptive wind, wide hipped whose short lance warrior glint whistles, shears into storm, the scout look for me, wind, your sword, your red mouth, airstream of ribbons lacing your tongue, guide my fugitive words, water grown audacity into air, a fearlessness, the fearlessness of fire, flight, Word spit spewed like melon seeds spreading creation. Rain falls and heavy thunder, the outrider, the cyclone, whose banner skirts twist oak and old cypress into baldness. Blow clear the Quilombo Road, Oya, their foot prints still pressed in a morning clay, alongside tracks that faint, refuge voices from memory hill, timbers of clove and wisteria, high John laughter and Ella song seeping from their long walk clothes. Over your shoulder, Fujida, turn, hook my gaze, Steady my scripting hand. Your hurricane shimmy in the pine limbs is the train rolling out. I am two passengers on your free or die railroad. Conduct me. My hidden mouth is a scythe in cane, is a river under the ocean, is my mother's lace work bones whirled up, gifts and labors, words that ride by moss and starshine, words that run. Mm. I'm going to get that book of poetry out of you yet. <laughs> I'm going to get one of the editors to start calling you every day, right? You know, asking. That, that was beautiful, my dear sister. Beautiful. Beautiful. Can you read another one for us? Uh, Want to read? Yeah, I guess I read something to help stir people up in terms of like trying to keep us going, <laughs> keep us alive. <laughs> uh, I guess reading. Um, oh, but that made me want to read the the the, the, the haku I did for for um, for Max Roach. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, um, because there's so much, there's so much history there, and so much history there, and so much of of our ancestry uh, that's there also too. Um, Brother Max is buried up at Woodlawn Cemetery, hmm. and and all the the musicians are there. Okay, 
all the musicians are there. Um, uh, um, uh, there's like an alcove of musicians there. And so uh, uh, Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, um, Illinois Jacquette, um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Brother Max and some other people are there too. Um, in fact, Miles said he wanted to be buried right in that, right next to uh, the Duke. And people said, you know, that's not going to happen. But Miles was was hip even at the end. He's right next there to Duke Ellington uh, there at that cemetery. Um, Mm. Um, and that musician's row there. Mm. Ten Haku for Max Roach. Nothing ends every blade of grass remembering your sound. Your sounds exploding in the universe return to earth in prayer. Da, ah, 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 boom, boom. Da, ah, ah, boom, 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 boom. Da, ah, 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 boom. As you drum, your hands kept reaching for God. The morning sky so lovely imitates your laughter. You came warrior clear, your music kissing our spines, feet tapping, singing in peach our blood. <laughs> You came drumming sweet life on sails of flesh. Your fast beat riding the air settles in our bones. Your drums soloing our breaths into the beat unbeat, into the beat unbeat, into the beat unbeat. Your hands shimmering on the legs of rain. Your hands. Shimmering on the legs of rain. Brother Max wrote, um, uh, a great, 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 great uh, um, musician. Wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness, my goodness. Right. Wow. What what collection is that in? Oh, sorry. That's in Morning Haku. Whoa. Uh, yeah. You know, I do a haku every morning as mm -hmm. a form of, of meditation, you know. And um, and so I've uh, in doing it, I, you know, I, I have this, I have like all these musicians now that I would listen to music at night and then wake up in the morning and whatever was processed as I went to sleep, listen to the jazz station, right? Waking up, you know, to the classical, uh, the, to the to the black classical music, to the to the classical music that they play in the morning. Also, I, I do a haku, and so um, I've just finished a whole suite of monk. You know, uh, uh, but the whole group of, of just all these musicians, you know, who were just amazing people. And you know, uh, I was at I was performing at the Blue Note, and one of the great jazz greats, and he's made transition now. You know, I he invited me to his table, and we were talking. I said, "Could I ask a question that I wanted to ask some of you, you jazz greats, for so long?" I said, and he said, "Yes, Sister Sonia." I said. Did you all understand what we were doing mm. uh, when we started to do this poetry? Mm. That of course we all had studied with great writers. I studied with Louise Bogan, you know that, right? Um, and so I knew how to write sonnets and villanelles and blank verse, whatever. But I said, when we heard you all play, we left like Coltrane did, that Western, right, constrict, and we went and we began to use our voice and we began to use whatever. I said, did you understand what we were doing? And he said, I should never forget it. He said, oh yes, sister. He said, because you could do it. Um, we did it with the music 
and quite often there was no there was no words to it but you all picked up on what we were doing and then yeah. came you know and you left words behind sometimes and i said we surely did on purpose right so that was that was so good you know hearing him say that you know i wanted to go get a recorder and say now i want to get you on <laughs> you know but that would be would have been really you know so i said but thank you and when i get home or i'm i'm going to write down what you just said but um uh, you know, that, that, that 60s and 70s period, you know, where Coltrane and all those people came, you know, facing us. You know, we had the music and we left that that Western, you know, construct that we had with words, whatever, you know, you know, and went with the sound, you know, um, uh, you know, and with the spirit and, and you know, and one of the, uh, the things that a poet said, uh, said, our words became the language where language in where language is in that's what we did our words became the language where languages end ah, and that you know that I, I think it was Rilke who did that who said that right and there we were you know where languages you know ended whatever uh, but, but the sound was there and the music that was there whatever and uh, I that coming back and I thank you so much I think I, I think you are we opening up for questions? Yeah, now? yeah, I was gonna say, I thought um, we've opened the chat. Right, and, um, and well, we were still chatting, you know? <laughs> you guys are still chatting and- uh, yes, Right, yes. We're so grateful. Wasn't she amazing, my dear brother? Amazing. Yes, amazing. right, she's an amazing poet, but she also is an amazing person doing that, uh, that biography, uh, that love song, that chant, that, um, um, that Pavon, Pavon for your mother, whatever, you know, uh, it and is. I have, a, I, have a, I have mine here and I, I just want to point out that we, that the um, Miriam, I don't remember your last name, I'm sorry, but at, um, at the publishing, um, at the publishing it's, um, company um, mm -hmm. have um, given us um, both, um, given us 40% discounts Oh. On, um, on on your book and and also your book um, uh, is I'm 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 black when I'm singing and and I'm blue oh, the when play I'm... the play is a collection of plays yeah, right plays. I'm, yeah I'm, which they, I'm they too, that too. right yeah and, um, right. you know I I hope everybody takes advantage of that and 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 purchases both books um, um, this. Um, this book, I think, should be a best, a national bestseller. Yeah. Tell uh, them who the best it is, uh, uh, um, Rachel. Yeah. Ra Rachel, uh, here. I think it's. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's um, the press, uh, same press where. Oh, uh, uh, Duke University Duke, Press. Duke University, University Press. press. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Same yeah. one with, with the plays. Uh, um, right. And purchase one for yourself and. And um, tell five other people, and let's let's get this thing out there because this has um, vital medicine for the future of the country and the world. Um, it, it's astonishing, as 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 you as both of you, um, Sister Sonia, as everything you say and 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 do and write. Um, and so we're going to open up for questions, and. Uh, Nina, you gonna help me? Hi, Nina. <laughs> A lot of love and gratitude. This <laughs> right here. Over here, she's shy. Uh -huh. Peter Garrity, it's so lovely to see you, man. God damn. Yeah. This is a this is such a brilliant, brilliant actor, and I haven't seen you in years. Mm -hmm. There you are. Um, it's it's a it's an honor. Yes, thank you for being here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which one? Uh, okay, um, baby, I, I can't get the this thing to behave, so I can't find Dear Mama and Sister Rachel, it is so wonderful to hear you both talk about your mothers. I wanted to say that your discussion about the spiritual experiences was so rich and so helpful for me as I write 
tonight, do you have any suggestions for bringing the spiritual experiences into our writing? Do we have a name? Pollard. I can't hear. Did, that was from Sharice Pollard. Did you hear the question? Oh, yes, it did. Okay. Rachel. Hi. Yeah. I'll just start. Hi, Sharice. She's a friend of mine, and I'm so happy that she's here with us tonight. Wow. Um, I don't know what to say other than just it probably will help if we recognize that those um, experiences are part of our natural experience of life, like breathing air and tasting and touching water and stepping on the earth. And so if we understand that they're not some, um, um, you know, right. supernatural separate kind of thing and don't treat them that way, exactly. then they come into our lives and in our work and our writing in, um, you know, in a more natural uh, form. That would be my response. And what I think also quite often people always want to go on the level, oh, you mean ghosts, whatever, et cetera. But I've been in my house and I've looked up, you know, and I've seen movement in the house, you know, and I look up and start smiling and say, how you doing, mama? You know, whatever. You know, the point is, you know, that uh, uh, people are there not to scare you. People are there to protect you. Yes. Uh, always the protection, whatever, you know? Um, and if you've ever been outside walking even, and you stepped off and you've had almost felt, uh, you, you stop, not because you stopped, but something stopped you. And sure enough, you should have been stopped by someone because you're not paying attention to stepping off that curb and, and things coming near you um, uh, as a consequence. Uh, but uh, they are always, I think, um, um, uh, uh, spirits, uh, for want of a better word, uh, they're always um, spirits, they're always uh, people uh, who populate our homes with us, right? Uh, you know, who tell us sometimes, you know, you don't really want to go down those steps, <laughs> you know, at some particular point, right? And you stop and we take it as like, we, I had a premonition, we, we, we put it into that terminology. Uh, but my dear sister, um, I do not think that people who have been on this earth with all this information, that the information gets lost, you know, when people make transition, uh, that that information goes into the universe, you know, and I mean, because I know it sometimes someone, people are always asking, so what were you feeling when you were writing this book, you know, that book that was nominated for this, and I said, I don't know, I sat down, and four hours later, you know, I had finished the book. Mm. You know, mm. Because you see, you know, you're working, you know, you're in that particular trance, you know, that there are other forces that take over, you know, the brain and the hands and the heart, you know, and the womb, whatever. And you look up and you look at the clock and sunlight is coming in at some point. And, you know, you leave it there, you go get some tea, you come back and then you read what you have written that you didn't know you had written. But there it is on many levels. But more than that, sometimes, you know, when we, if we would just understand that when we have grief sometimes, instead of turning to a bottle, you know, you know, or like, you know, even, you know, uh, whatever. But if we just turn to those, to, to, to those spirits, you know, outside when you're walking, when you sit down under a tree and you begin to talk to that tree, you know, and you tell that you touch that tree, you put your arms around that tree, you get the energy from that tree, that you know that for that day, you know, you will be cured, you know, of whatever, you know, uh, thoughts you were thinking at some particular point. Um, but there are forces, you know, here, you know, uh, and we're all, you know, hear, oh yeah, you know, we all hear the wind and the thunder, you know, we all hear the mother hugging us quite often and protecting us, you know, uh, we all 
hear sometimes have been awakened, you know, by the cries of our ancestors, you know, um, especially sometimes when you might have acted like a fool, you know, <laughs> or you had not gone to the level that you should have gone to. And what they're saying is that girl, 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 we have given you too much information, you know, for you to back down, you know, and, and uh, from any kind of challenge at all. Now, you know, I'm saying it, um, I hope in an easy fashion, my dear sister, um, but I'm just saying that uh, our mothers do not die. They always are with us in our bodies, in our hearts, you know, whatever. And all you have to do is stop and talk to them and thank them for being there to protect you, you know, always. Um, and the, the obvious protections we seek sometimes is that, you know, you know, is that you know, something physical, whatever, but the protection is that, you know, go to sleep and, and snuggle up, you know, next to your mother and, and talk to her, you know, uh, as you dream and thank her for giving birth to you, but thank her also for being with you, protecting you always as you walk on this earth, uh, you know, period. Yeah. I hope that made sense to you, my sister. Thank you. Um... It, it just reminds me of the book, and uh, we begin with your with your mother's great great grandfather. Um, I mean, sorry, great great grandmother Mariah Grant. Um, I mean, the book it has exactly the quality that Sister Sonia was describing just now, and um, and the 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 presence of 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 the past. You know. Um, okay, I have more questions. Um, this well, one. Well, the past has never passed, really. You know, and and and. And the future is never there, you know, but, 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 you know, we're here in the present always, mm -hmm. you know, and if we would deal with that present, you know, right, you know, you know, we would be a much happier people uh, and people walking on this earth, whatever, you know, uh, but, and I think that's important. I'm not saying you don't, you don't take from that, those periods, whatever, but you're in the present whatever, you know, you're moving in the present and the past is the past, you know, and at some point, you know, when you dream, you know, you know, when you go to sleep, you know, in, 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 in that Egyptian tomb, whatever, et cetera, you know, you know, you can be told about the past, but you got to realize we're in the present, whatever, but we can visualize a future on this earth. I visualize an America. You know, I know what I want for America, but my it is my present that is making me do that, whatever, you know, if you truly understand that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, from Martika Williams, thank you so much for sharing. Um, it was, I was incredibly moved. My question, uh, why do you think the movement has had several pauses and how do you advise we continue to work toward lasting change? So that's that. That's going to take the next couple of hours to. Uh... <laughs> Do you want to start at all, my dear sister? Okay, I will start. I'm sorry, and then let you please uh, um, fill out everything that I'm I'm leaving where I'm leaving spaces. You know, um, it it was Sister Martika. Was that her name? Who who? Okay. Yes. So my response um, to that. Sister Matika, when I think of, I think of two kinds of things. One, I think of how powerful and in how many ways the movement for radical transformation, what my dad used to call the expansion of democracy democracy. in this country. Mm -hmm. um, the way that that touched almost every aspect of our society between, you know, the mid fifties with the uh, Brown versus Board of Education uh, decisions up really up until, you know, we get to Nixon and Reagan. Um, if you look at that period of the country, you see that the black led Southern freedom movement and then more broadly, the black led um, movement all over the country that, that was manifested in the black arts movement, in the black power movement, 
and the Panthers in SNCC gave inspiration to everybody. The women's movement, the anti-war movement, the student movement, Chicano and Puerto Rican rights movements, the American Indian movement, the Brown Berets, um, everybody was basically saying, if black people who are being treated like dogs in this country for so many generations can stand up with their own vision of what an alternative America that is a healthy and humane place for everybody, if in the midst of all of the assault that they experience, they can do this, we can do it too. And let's try to find some ways to do it together. Now, I was a child. I came into this experience kind of, I was born in 62. So by the time that I was beginning to be conscious, 67, 68, 69, this country was extraordinary. This is what I remember as a little girl. There was so much richness and possibility and potential. Now, getting to your question, Sister Martika, my sense is that, and it's not just my sense, because as a scholar, this, this is what history and the scholarship shows us. This tremendous um, kind of, of um, collaboration, of solidarity, of, of uh, threats to the status quo, status quo were very distressing to the FBI, to economic powers in the country, to many people in the status quo. And there were a variety of measures among which the, the neoliberal economic system that had solidified um, the, the, the um, particular manifestations and strengthening of systems of mass incarceration and the creation of what we have now, which is in so many, uh, many ways similar to a kind of police state. I mean, these things took um, shape in the context of the status quo in our country saying, we don't want that. We are not really comfortable with this tremendous multiracial, multicultural, um, various gendered, different languages. We don't, we're not sure we want that for this country. But I'm trying to tell you, and I want Aunt Sonia to talk about it too, that as a child, there was so much excitement in the possibility of what could be here in this country, if all of us, with all of our ancestors, with all of our creativities, not, necess not expecting that it would be an easy remaking of the nation, but that it would be a necessary remaking of America into a place that is home, that is humane, that is compassionate for everybody who lives here. The country was had 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 legs moving in that direction, and then there were so many ways economically, politically, socially, edu public education just gutted completely in the country to stop this. And so, I, um, to to sum, I've already probably said more than I intended to, oh, but my on. point is that there had the the the. The places, the, the pauses that you're asking about, Martika, have to do really with tremendous assault to stop a movement that was really inspiring not only the nation, but lots of people in different parts of the world. Wow. People in South Africa, people in Nicaragua, people in um, Brazil and in other parts of Latin America people in Asia who were looking at folks in the United States again saying, you know, if y'all in the belly of the beast can fight this stuff, 
can hold on to some imaginative possibilities of what it is to be truly human in the world that, hey, we can do it too. And let's try to find ways to do it together. So I would just say, I think it's important for us to remember, to learn those histories and to be inspired by what has happened in this country and to know this is our country. And there are people here who have done, who have dreamed, who have imagined, who have created extraordinary institutions and collaborations and connections and their energies are still here with us. Those, those are resources that are still available to us, but we need to learn the his, excuse me, the history and remind ourselves and step into that, not alone. That's another thing, another beautiful thing that Aunt Sonia said at the beginning. I think what enabled Certainly my parents and, and Sonia can speak for herself, but I think that this is probably true for her too. What enabled that generation of activists to be so much to, to stay on the battlefield to keep as, as uh, Sonia said at the outset, holding up that freedom banner is they were not doing it alone and they did not feel like they were doing it alone. They felt like they were connected to a community abroad, in some cases, international community of people who had another vision for what's possible in the world. So I would say, hold on to that, build that and hold on to that. Ah, so that's it. I mean, that is it, what you just said, you know? You know, I watch people, I watch the books that are coming out now, my dear sister Rachel, on what people did, right? And you watch the rewriting of history right now. It's amazing how people rewrite it, okay? But one of the things that I want you to know, my dear sister who asked that question, is that we were always at the point of saying one thing, that it was on our generation, we thought, to talk about what does it mean to be human? We realized at some point that nothing would really continue to advance until we began to answer that question, whatever. And many people would say, ah, you know, why do you keep asking that question? Because if we don't answer that question, whatever, you know, we might as all, all of us should go into a room, pull down the shade, take out some weed and smoke it and drink some wine, whatever. I mean, and that's it. And just stay there. Because if we don't answer that question, I don't care how many movements we have, my dear sister, we'll get back to a state of stasis. All movements have this, you know, because what happens, you know, all of a sudden the, uh, the powers that be, the military that be, whatever, et cetera, they began to, to do their work, whatever, you know, they began to, to, at some point, you know, stop what was going on. In many ways, uh, they've done it, you know, and I don't have to go into the detail. Uh, you did some of that, my dear sister. Uh, and so we seem to be at a state of stasis that all of a sudden, our dear sisters, you know, Black Lives Matter, right? You know, amazing. Yeah. It came up. I remember when I was first asked to go and speak. I didn't know who they were, whatever, you know. Um, uh, I know there were people in the audience, you know, who were who didn't seem to be uh, friendly at all. But I listened, you know, and began to understand that those those three sisters who began that, you know, had a vision for what they wanted to do, whatever. And one of the things that I've always said at some point. That whenever, you know, when we came out in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the black arts, you know, uh, when we, when I was in New York Corps, uh, you know, when we began with, with uh, the black arts uh, 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 movement, uh, which went from the black arts movement to uh, black studies, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I began to understand my father's concern. He said to me, you went from New York Corps where you almost, were, you know, all of you used to get stampeded by the horses, the police, whatever. Uh, uh, you went then to uh, something called black arts, right? You know, where with your words, you took on America. Uh, and then all of a sudden you say to me, you're moving to California to begin something called black studies. Every time there's a black word in front of it, there's a problem, whatever. But from black studies <laughs> came women's studies, came right. studies. Right, exactly. Came American, Native exactly. American studies, right, came, you know, I mean, all the studies came out of that. And we yeah. saw it, and America was so angry at us because we started that whatever at some point. I'm home 
in um, San Francisco, my landlord, who was a Japanese American, a great brother, who, had, who that who was uh, I helped his daughter, um, uh, you know, do some work in English, whatever. And so he had given me a, a great Samoyed, right? That I was initially frightened of that big dog, whatever, etc. But he said, Professor Sanchez, there are two men here who want to see you. And he opens. He, I said, Well, come in. Um, he opens the door, and in came these two guys, and and. The guy reached in into his pocket and said, FBI. Hmm. So I said, oh, I lived in the Hay Ashbury district. You would know that if you understand what I mean, whatever. And I said, oh, is there a problem? Because there was always a problem in that district. He said to my landlord, you should put her out. She's one of those, what did they call us at that time? Um, what's militants, oh, militants militant. on campus, right? And I'm sitting there looking, standing there looking at the same militants. I'm a professor on the campus. I am teaching black studies. I'm teaching black literature, right? Okay. Uh, all the way from our enslavement, all the way up to Du Bois and Garvey, right? The first semester, right? And, and I'm teaching that, you know, I am teaching creative writing. And so my landlord said, well, I'm leaving now, Professor Sanchez, and he will leave. And the guy was furious at me, shaking his hand at me. You're out there teaching. Yes, we were teaching Garvey and Du Bois and, 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 and Langston Hughes and, and all Zora Neale Hurston, all these people. So I was so naive. I looked at this man and said, yes, I am teaching them. They're in the first semester of Black literature. I have to teach them. You cannot teach it without Du Bois and Garvey, whatever. The guy looked at me like, duh, duh, duh. Right. And what they were saying is that we had rescued Du Bois from oblivion. People had to yeah. teach. You don't teach this man. The newer generation, our generation came and we rescued him from oblivion, right? And, and, and Garvey from oblivion, right? And we began to teach all these people. And we saw people, 40, 50, 60 students in your classroom before your eyes change. Hmm. They came in like this, like, I don't know, I belong here. And by mid semester, they were like this. Right. Really, I want more. I want more. I want more. That's what we're talking about. And so these men were there. And so I said, you know, well, that's what, you know, I'm talking about. And, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, I mean, they really were, were so angry that, you know, I turned around and all of a sudden my dog that, they, that, that, my, that my landlord had given me came walking down the hallway. He sat down and he looked up, big white dog. You know, mm. with these green eyes, right? Looked up at this man, and this man put his hand in my face again, and Snow leaped for him. And I turned around and said, Snow, and he sat down. I said, My goodness, maybe this dog isn't too bad after all, right? You know, but anyway, um, you know, the guy said, Lady, control your dog. And I said, Snow, and he did not move at all. And I said simply, I think you should really leave now because I don't know what else I can tell you. I am teaching, I am, I'm a professor. I'm teaching literature, black literature, you know, but we were teaching Du Bois and Garvey, you know, and Langston Hughes and all the people that were not in these classrooms, if you understand at that particular time, when they left, hmm. you know, I opened the door and they left and they turned around and the other guy never said a word at all. I call uh, Miss Hudson at the Schomburg, who had given me all these books, right? And I called her and I said, Miss, Miss Hudson, the FBI just left my house. And I said, they were talking about, you're teaching Du Bois. Du Bois, they said. They didn't say Du Bois the way we say Du Bois. Um, Garvey. And I said, can you imagine? I'm just teaching literature, right? Isn't that right? She said, oh, my dear. I thought you knew that if you taught some of these people, you might get in a little trouble. Mm -hmm. Ooh. But there we were. And what I'm saying simply at that particular point, that all over in one year in America, you had all these programs coming up from women's studies, you know, from Chicano studies to Puerto Rican studies, you know, to Asian studies, whatever, all of these things coming up and they asked for our help to help establish it, whatever. And what we did is that we changed the whole matrix 
you know, of the educational system. We said no longer will you go into a university and not see yourself or someone like yourself because you didn't start teaching black studies, but all of a sudden I'm walking to a classroom and someone says, Sonia, Sonia, we think this has to do with Japanese American. It was a poster asking them to report a report to a certain place. And what was that? They were being sent to concentration camps. That's right. what they were at that right. particular point, right. being sent to concentration camps and that reality, whatever. And we began to understand fully, you know, what that was about. And the Japanese, I had two Japanese American students in my class. And when I asked them, did they know about concentration camps? And they said, no, we don't know about it at all. In fact, they were angry at me for bringing it up. But I said, well, why don't you take this poster home and ask your parents? They will return on a Tuesday morning to the classroom. And they had tears in their eyes. Their parents told them about their lives in a concentration camps, you know, in these detention centers because they were Japanese Americans. That happened in a place called America, whatever. And I am in a place called Seattle years later. And I see this young woman jumping down the steps and she runs across the stage and said, remember me, Professor Sanchez. And she was the student in that class. She said, I did the documentary with some other people on my parents in concentration camps. And so what I'm saying simply, my dear sister, what you said, because I didn't want to repeat what you said, I wanted that to be on her head um, and in her body, in her bloodstream, you know, that what we began to do is that we open up the educational system, you know, to the world. And we didn't say, you can't come in if you're white, if you're Latino. They came in and they learned you know, from our syllabus, you know, from the syllabi, whatever. And they learned how to put theirs together. And all of a sudden, the university changed, you know, and it has changed, has it not? Yes, it has. But also, it went out into the world. You, know, you end up with NPR, you end up with all these other things, you know, on the radio, because that came out of the whole thing of Black studies, because we went in to the radio stations and we began to do the work that you began to see, you know, on the television and on uh, the, uh, the NPR stations also too, you know, the kind of conversation that we have, that we began in America. The conversation was saying, no longer in education where we do not see people who help build America. No longer in education that children and young people would sit down and every time you got to a black face, it will be like him eating a watermelon. What I saw like, oh gee, this is good watermelon, ain't it? Whatever. And that was what you saw for someone being black you know, or a Chicano, whatever, said, oh, yes, oh, yes, si, senor, senor, you know, me no like to work, but Conchita, she do the work, whatever, et cetera. We learned how we did not boo the Native Americans when they were fighting, you know, for their land, for their land. And we began to, I remember, we began to cheer for the Native Americans, always, whatever, et cetera. All, all, all I'm saying is that we were saying, let's level this sucker. Here, you know, let us look at this country and say simply, you are great because of the great people in here, yes, not yes. the great few, yes. but the great people here. You know, I'm, I'm going too long. I see people getting nervous. I think we probably um, uh, need to go off, but I hope we're we, close we, to the end. It's, um, uh, the, the, the kids are, are, are restless out here, but oh, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. I have, may I ask uh, just two more questions? Um, uh, uh, one for you, Rachel, that uh, came from my brother, Alex Anderson, who's here, who is the director of our Ritual for Return, part of our arts justice program. And he asks, uh, you wrote in Remnants uh, that your mother witnessed Martin Luther King's change um, and became or, or became lustrous. Did you, the word lustrous, what did you mean? Um, what did that mean to you? Um, and what was that experience like to hear uh, from your mother? Okay. Yes. Um, what it was Brother Alex? That was his name? Yes. The man who, okay. Thank you for the question, Brother Alex. You know, um, my response, I think, is going to be in the same vein of what um, Sister Sonia was talking about initially. And that is simply that in the African-American tradition, just like indigenous traditions all over the world, there is an understanding that we are more than just our physical self. 
We are energy, we are spirit, we are connected to everything in the world. And there, and many of us, if we allow ourselves, if we develop those capacities, um, have the ability to sense these things and see these things. And my mother was certainly that kind of person. So at that a time when she had that experience. This was in Atlanta. Either I wasn't born or I might have been just a little baby, so I don't remember it um, personally, but she told me the story. For those of you who may not have read um, the book yet, my, my mom and dad worked with uh, a Martin and Coretta and a lot of folks in the uh, movement in, in Atlanta and various other places in the South. And there was this one instance when my mother and a friend went to um, talk to uh, Dr. King. They were he was asking my parents to get ready to could go do go to a trip. I think in Alabama in in um, preparation for um, a campaign. Perhaps it was Birmingham. It's in the book. I've forgotten exactly. But in any case, she went to see him, and as a part of the conversation, she said at a certain moment. She just saw um, a kind of lustrousness, a kind of shine, a kind of aural energy around him. And she noted that. And she asked this friend who was with her if she had seen it. And the friend said she, you know, she hadn't noticed it. But my mom said it really struck her that she saw this energy around uh, Dr. King. And so, you know, that's one of the stories that went into the book. So I, as I said, I, you know, I didn't, I was a child and I don't even know that I was there in that moment. But um, those kinds of experiences are things that my mother would talk about. Uh, so it wasn't unusual, not just in terms of Dr. King, but other people. Um, those are things that are just, as I said, part certainly of the African-American mystic tradition that I was raised in. And I think and lots of other people with connection to indigenous roots understand that, you know, there are, there are lots of ways to see and to interact with, with what is here in the world. And we are more than just our physical selves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, darn it. I cannot, <laughs> Joanne, I need, I need you here uh, to navigate this thing. I am. Um... <laughs> All right, I'm going to go to this last question. Uh, this is a long. Um, this 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 might inspire um, a long response, but when we are at the end, but uh, this is from Taylor, and uh, she asks. I'm assuming it's a she, maybe a he. Uh, what can we as young people do to carry on the work of our ancestors, and how do we stay hopeful for a better future? Is that for me? Yeah, that could be for both. I think both of you could could weigh in, and then we'll, and then we'll say good night. Uh, you want me to start, uh, my sister? Sure, uh, Sonia. Thank you. Go ahead. Give you a minute. Um, first of all, I, this whole movement is not just about hope. Hmm. Uh, it's about history and history. Um, that's why I keep reminding people, it is about, you know, being finally, you know, uh, understanding why we evolved to this form. Hmm. You know, evolution caused us to be like this. Are we now going to say evolution, you made a mistake? Hmm. <laughs> you know, you should have left us, you know, as some of the lower animals at some point, right? Right? You should not have brought us out of the sea finally so we could evolve, whatever. So there's no mistake here. No. Uh, the point is simply is that, you know, what men, some men and women have evolved to, what they thought about, you know, in terms of economics, right? You know, uh, in terms of identity, color. Uh, in terms of, of you know, um, uh, money, you know, you know what it means, what the, what it means to have money on on this earth. Um, so, one of the things that that I think that we've got to 
began to, to really look at at some particular point and realize at some point that you know, there is no way that we will survive on this earth until we begin to really examine what it means to be human and how we move in that direction, you know, as people on this earth. Um, that uh, people can give us, um, I mean, I've seen programs like, you know, we say, and, and it's true that as Martin said, uh, we need to have um, uh, uh, a base pay for everybody. So therefore people will not, you know, go out and commit, commit acts that will be will end, you know, end them up in jail someplace, whatever, that we need a guaranteed wage. And I think we should have that, but that is not going to make, you know, for a successful tenure on this earth. That's mm -hmm. only part of it. And so one of the things that I did, and I, I, I'm gonna remind me um, to send you a copy uh, Sister Rachel, that one of the things that we need to do is that we need to talk about having, uh, you know, uh, 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 a, a bunch of committees, not just to meet, but to do action on, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 a, a committee of like, you know, uh, of, of engineering um, how we how we be. I mean, I'm blanket on the exact word. I didn't realize I was going to pull from an old essay that I did. Um, uh, what, in other words, like one of the things that we that we know is that when people say things, it like when they're presidents and they say send these long, terrible words out, and there's no response from it, not even from the news, right? People do a news, but that. Um, but there's a committee of, 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 of engineering, if I'm missing a word, where we would have people, five or six people, who would always respond to anything that goes on in the world, period. And we and all these, some of these millionaires that the people who could spend money, all kinds of cars, whatever, we would ask them to let us run that in a newspaper and on the idiot box that is the television, whatever, you know, a response and just have at the end concerned citizens, whatever, et cetera. In other words, what we're talking about is that granted, we need to make sure that people have a guaranteed income that will not solve the problem of racism in America right and everything else whatever but what we'll solve at some point is that no one can say what this person did for four years the things they said without a response mm -hmm. without a response from concerned citizens without a response from people who say simply that is not human what you said you know that is off the human grail whatever and so so therefore we are responding concerned citizens of america whatever etc and it goes out and we we ask the people with money to put it in the new york times you know uh the washington post the la times whatever whatever concern but teaching people mm -hmm. how they should think how they should respond not like by god and by g let's make a joke of what he said it's no bloody joke you know, you know, you know, it's a joker, but it's no bloody joke at all. You know, this, these are very serious things that were put out into the atmosphere for us to absorb, for people to absorb, you know, and without a response, you have people four years later believing what was said. And so they will go in a place called Washington, D.C. and say simply the same words again, unless you meet those words head on and say, this is really what this is truly all about. We've got to have that kind of response, you know. Um, um, uh, this, in, what I call engineering uh, of, of, of words that image engineering, you know, we've got to have that, we have got to make the images that we want to be seen by America. And I hope I'm making sense on this. I'm lingering on this one thing because this is an important thing that the newspapers did not try to combat the image that this, that 45 was doing, whatever. You know, who does that? You know, comedians did it, they laughed at them. I used to say that, okay, you laugh. Now what's the serious part of this laughter, whatever. And the serious part is simply is that we need a committee of image engineering. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> of simply that anytime someone says anything, whatever, there is a response with no name other than, you know, concern 
Americans, concerned citizens, whatever, no name to be targeted, whatever, but very clearly clear, asking the newspapers, put this sucker in here for free, whatever, et cetera, because you're not responding, whatever, because you, you know, your newspaper is probably owned by a billionaire already, whatever, so we're going to do it, whatever. And we put it in there, or we ask the millionaires that we that, that uh, who are friendly to put it in. But so people can read it and see what we used to do. Uh, the reason I know it can work because whenever something happened in America, we would go on the subway, go and and people going to work, and we would have up on the the wall. You know, we'd get there four o'clock in the morning, right, and put up you know what you should know about this statement, whatever, and people would read it. Hmm. Take it on the subway with them. You say, um, you know, I, I'm talking about things that really need to be done when you have newspapers who don't do the work. You know, the fourth estate is not being the fourth estate at this particular point. And so we, the people, must become the fourth estate. You know, we must respond, not say, oh, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do, sucker. You know what to do. You know, oh, so yeah, I don't know really what to think. I don't think that way. Then say it. You know, give us some money so we can do this, whatever, et cetera. So what I'm saying simply as some particular point, you know, uh, yes, this is what I call a recession, you know, a recession of minds in America, right? You know, uh, a recession of people who say, I don't know, I just want him out. Him out will not change what is going on in America, this fascism that is going on here. But what will change is it is we. Who would change it? And it was we who must come up with programs, you know, uh, to change it, whatever. And know that we must do it because you see, we must inform, you know, some of the younger people who are working. These these young people are doing some amazing work. But I ask the question, you know, you know, how long can we mourn another one who is killed, child killed in the street? Huh? You know, this mourn has gone from the south to the north, yeah. from the west to the East, how long do we mourn, you know, you know, and say what needs to be done, you know, period, you know, you know, and that is what we finally are talking about, whatever. And that is what I mean is that, you know, the, the work that the young people have done to organize is amazing and they keep doing the work, you know, the, the work that we all must do also in terms of like making, you know, making people begin to understand uh, what, what is. And our friends also too, you know, our friends must not be just friends because they help us get jobs or like they, they're really cool or they look good, whatever. But when something comes up that friend has got to be a friend of the people whatever you know what can you contribute you know on your job what do you do to make sure that there, there is some change that happens in america and i mean that's just one little spot on that but there were 12 things that i figured out and wrote about um uh, you know, at some point, as we looked at what was going on here in this country, whatever, and how we do slow things. So my sister, getting back to the point, you know, don't tell me you're tired. I, someone, a student friend, said, I'm tired, Professor Sanchez. I've been working the whole year. I said, shut up. I was told that by Queen Mother, well, shut up, Sonia. How can you be tired? I've been working for 50 some years. How can you be tired working for one year, two years? Come on. What is this about? You're tired? You're tired? It's a lifetime work. It's a work for this earth. We will not save this earth unless we work, you know. And yes, we can we can have fun, yes, but work to change the ideas that are running rapid, not only here in America, but in the world now, whatever. And there are words, you know, for the very, 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 very rich people, you know, in the military who say simply, I don't like the way you're going here, you know, so therefore we must try to effect some change. And we must say, we must effect change too and sit down and begin to talk about how that is to be done. I hope I didn't go too long. Oh, that's good, good, oh. good, good. Uh, that's wonderful. And actually, Aunt Sonia, your statement about the, um, the, the 12 point um, text that you created reminds me of something that I think could also be helpful. There's a wonderful uh, Black feminist named Barbara Smith who oh, yeah. created a similar kind of document called the Ella Baker Fannie Lou Hamer Plan. It's based on the Marshall Plan, which of course was uh, put into use in Europe at the end of World War II to kind of 
reinvigorate the economies that had been decimated by the war. And what Barbara Smith is saying is very similar to what uh, Sonia just shared with us, is that the need in our country, particularly for African American communities, for poor people, for Latinos, Native people, for um, marginalized and oppressed people in the United States, need a um, an economic, political, cultural, social plan that supports the humane and just um, restructuring of the society. And so if you if you are, you know, on, well, everybody, if you look and you're on your computers, but if you um, go to uh, the Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer plan, both of those women were two of the Persuaded. primary, the strongest leadership uh, in the Southern Freedom Movement and who carried this kind of, of concern for, um, for widespread and, and inclusive um, um, policies around healthcare, around um, daycare, around education, around what um, AOC and others are calling the green economy. What Barbara Smith is, is doing is pulling from the tradition of African-American organizing in the 60s and 70s, and then looking at, at contemporary Black Lives Matter and um, progressive organizing and looking to say, what are, are some of the very specific kinds of things that will benefit our society uh, that we need so that we can survive together and so that we can take care of each other uh, uh, as a society. So as, as Sonia was talking, I thought about that and I would recommend that as, as something um, um, for people to look at. But the other thing that I would say uh, to the sister who was asking about encouragement and you know how we keep ourselves uh, encouraged for this work, and it is not easy. I agree with that. It is not easy. You know, I think about how uh, Sonia and my parents and their generation did it, and then I think, well, you know, for those in my age and younger, what is it that we have inherited? Maybe that we don't we aren't always even aware of, but what is it that we have inherited that helps us? And I think there are two things that come to my mind. One is just believing very powerfully that this is our country. Mm -hmm. This is our nation. And we have the right and the responsibility and the capacity to make it as beautiful, as wonderful, as rich, as inclusive, as humane as we can possibly do that. And we are able to do that. And the reason we're able to do it is because we are always accompanied. Now this I say is related to the way my mama and my daddy, but especially my mama taught me to believe. And this comes from our ancestral traditions of knowing that we are never by ourselves and that there are long lineages of folks who have been fighting for this country to reach its potential, to reach a humane and, and full and welcoming potential for all who are here, who all, for all who need to be here, for, for all who, who come into being here that there's space for, for everybody, that there's welcome for people. And there's a whole lineage of millions of people who believe that and who live their lives with welcome and who live their lives with concern for other people. We have that tradition. We don't always think about it, but we have that tradition in this country and we can build on it. So I would just say, know that you are not by yourself. Your mm -hmm. sojourner is with you. Frederick is with you. Harriet is with you. And Corby I'll, and is I'll, with you. And yes. I'll give you a telephone number. We'll be with you also too. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, you have ancestors and you have people living and find the other people around you who mm -hmm. are concerned about this. And even if you have to start gathering just in these virtual ways, until we can get together in some parks when the weather is better, or until when COVID is over, we can get together in buildings. Find these folks who share that vision 
of what's possible here and spend time with each other and talk about how what you imagine for this place that is your home. This is our home. Yep. This is our ancestors home and hopefully this will be our children's and grandchildren's home and we can make it something wonderful for all of us. We have that capacity and we have the help um, um, of, of, of the spirits, of the ancestors, of the energies um, who, who walk with us. And so I would just say, at least that's what helps me. I think about, you know, my folks and all of the folks who came before them and just how much they believed in what was possible here. And, um, and I'm not giving that up because this is my home and this is my country. And uh, I, want, I want it to be beautiful. I want it to be beautiful. May, may, I, uh, may I bring this together um, just by reading the last words um, and let Rosemary have the last word here. I mean, the very last words, the class, it's your class that you brought her into and she's talking to your students. And um, the very last thing she says is, the main thing is to be grateful. Call your parents and tell them how much you appreciate what they've done for you. Or anybody else who has helped you be to become the beautiful, loving, and intelligent person you are. Thank someone. Thank your ancestors. That will make us rise to the occasion. So Sister Sonia Sanchez, Sister Rachel Harding, thank you so, so much for, for, for giving, this, giving this gift to us. Thank you, my thank brother. You. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you all for coming. Uh, it's so meaningful. It's so meaningful to us. Um, this is a beloved community. Um, mm -hmm. This is Rosemary's dream and uh, Sister Sonia and Rachel. And um, please do yourself a favor and, and take advantage, 40% off, buy this book. It's, it will change your life. Um, do we it, do it through you? Yeah, it's in the chat. There's a, a coupon in there so you can grab that. Um, we'll make that available. I think it's, it's gonna be alive for a little while. So we'll, we'll make it available. Um, it's the best. And these two women, uh, I, in my first correspondence, I call I described you as American royalty. It's the best that this country has produced. It not British, not British. <laughs> not British, American, American royalty. Um, American, right. So, um, thank you, thank you, sisters. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming and being with us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. uh, much love to you. Mm -hmm.